Welcome to the PharmaSource podcast. The pharma industry has a looming revenue gap. Many large brands that are losing exclusivity over the next five years, a significant revenue gap could potentially develop. We've estimated $300 billion of pharma revenue at risk from loss of exclusivity. Today, I'm joined on the PharmaSource podcast by Adam Siebert and Jeff Holder from LEK Consulting. And today we're going to talk about horizon scanning forecasting the trends which are shaping drugs, technologies, and treatments so that farm companies and manufacturers alike can anticipate and plan for their development and manufacturing, often many years ahead. Um, but to start with, Adam and Jeff, great to have you on the podcast. Can you please introduce yourself and what you do at LEK, please? Sure. Thanks, Luke. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, so this is Adam speaking. Um, so Jeff and I are part of LEK Consulting, which is a global strategy consulting firm. Um, we work specifically in a subsector that's called the life science enablers, which basically is what we like to say is anything that a biopharma company would buy on a B2B basis. Those are the types of companies that we support. Um, so within our practice, Jeff and I work specifically within the biopharma manufacturing and supply chain. Uh, so thinking about all the tools, equipment, consumables, services that are associated with making a drug. Mm -hmm. um, and so we each have kind of different points of, of specialization. Um, I do a bit more in the operations and services side of, of, of the, the industry and ecosystem. Um, and, and Jeff does a bit more on the tools uh, and, and equipment and consumables part. So we kind of come, come at it from different angles, but spend a lot of time kind of working in this, this part of the industry. Um, so great to have you on, Jeff. I'm not sure anything else uh, to add. No, thanks for the introduction, Adam. Luke, thanks for having us on the podcast. This is Jeff Holder, partner based out of San Francisco. Uh, only thing I'd add is a uh, scientist by training. I was a chemist in my former life, spent some time in drug discovery uh, and focused, like Adam said, on enabling technologies and tools uh, that help for the discovery, manufacturing, and supply chain of drugs. And we've covered the, the gamut. We've done everything from cell, gene, RNA, increasingly getting into ADCs, radio pharmaceuticals as uh, the market and our, our clients uh, have needs that are emerging and, and, and following the ball with the trends in the space. Fantastic. Thank you. So horizon scanning, why is it so critical within the biopharma industry? And, and what would you say the benefits are of long range forecasting, both for the CDMOs and also for the sponsors? I think this comes down to a few different angles as we mm -hmm. think about it, right? So for the CDMOs and, and sponsors, it's really taking a long long view of what are the new and emerging technologies that are coming online to, that for sponsors could spur drug discovery and open new uh, uh, pathways to targeting previously un, undruggable targets hmm. um, and, and really starting to develop the uh, infrastructure within a company to be able to go after those those uh, uh, modalities and, and targets. I think for CDMOs, uh, and also for the tools providers, it's thinking about what are the products and services that we should bring on online to be able to better serve the market and our customers in the long term, right? So much of bioprocessing uh, is is locked in, right? In terms of you know being able to support the commercial products that has really that that ship started sailing years ago, right? If we think about where it is today, and so it's really thinking about where is the ball going to be in three, five, 10 years. So that way we are positioned with the right infrastructure uh, and, and perhaps most importantly, the right people and expertise to be able to serve those clients uh, uh, as, the, as the ball moves forward. And what would a typical project like that be? So when you're working with a, with a customer, what, what are the problems which they're trying to solve? Part of the problems that, that we're trying to solve is um, thinking about, again, are there new and novel technologies that we should invest in uh, so that way we can start supporting customers as they move into new technologies. Um, should we bring on additional uh, uh, supply and capacity, uh, right? If we think about some of the more emerging technologies where maybe, you know, we don't have the right infrastructure, we don't have the right, you know, bioreactor setups uh, to support, you know, a, a, an emerging technology, what should we bring into the facility or do we need to build a new facility to support it, right? Um, then there's also different technologies and, and uh, that can be used to 
um, shift from, you know, things that were used predominantly for monoclonal antibodies and monoclonal antibody production, that's not fit for purpose as you think about new modalities. And so what uh, uh, innovations do we need to think through to meet the unmet needs of kind of these emerging technologies um, is certainly part of uh, the ecosystem that we that we think about. Yeah, that's a great overview, Adam. The only thing I would add is is why it's important and, and why we should think about long range forecasting and, and, and market scanning more broadly. From a sponsor lens, uh, if, if if you're wrong, you either uh, risk undersupplying drug to the market. Uh, we've obviously seen this with some of the uh, Clip One class and the the Ozembics and Wagovis of the world in, in obesity, or in, in, even in the radio pharmaceutical space, we've seen we've seen massive constraints there on supply. So under under uh, uh, achieving your market potential because of uh, uh, underestimation of supply, uh, or on the other hand, um, um, uh, being being burdened with overcapacity, we we've helped a number of clients this year answer the question of what do we do with this facility that's being underutilized? It's a huge operating expense. Mm -hmm. on the balance sheet in a time when capital is expensive and, and access to funding is, is quite sparse. So having an extra $30 million plus of operating uh, expenditure on the balance sheet is, is really tough to swallow for a lot of companies these days. Uh, from a CDMO space, uh, why is it important? Well, again, if you're behind on investing in capacity, you're going to miss trends and miss the wave. Uh, for example, there are CDMOs that are, are, are building out their ADC or radio ligand pharmaceutical capabilities now. And then some of them have been uh, smarter and, and, and looking on, on the horizon and have built out in advance, somewhat at risk. And they're they're capitalizing from, from the demand that is following. Whereas conversely, if, if you're behind, then, then again, you have the, the risk of losing share or not being able to capture uh, demand from some of these trends that you aren't mm -hmm. fit to play and, and capture. And what are some of those key trends that you're seeing at the moment? You know, the, the different the different waves that you mentioned there, Jeff. Sure. So let, let's let's just pull back and say what, what's what's going on in this space right now. Mm. The pharma industry has a looming revenue gap, many large brands that are losing exclusivity over the next five years. And what's driving, because of the loss of exclusivity, a significant revenue gap could potentially develop. We, we've estimated over the next five years, potentially $300 billion of pharma revenue at risk from loss of exclusivity. So it's, it's a huge revenue gap. You know, It's a bit over a trillion dollar industry. So that's a big chunk of it. Uh, that's at mm. risk from, I mean, there's major brands like like, like Keytruda going off patent in uh, 2028, I believe. So uh, pharma needs to find the next blockbusters, the next big things uh, to, to fill this revenue gap. Conversely, there's also some pressure from uh, the Inflation Reduction Act uh, about different timing of exclusivity. So so if you've got a uh, what, what would be a biologic drug, uh, the, the proposal is 14 years of, of exclusivity versus nine for small molecules. So there's some macro trends from a policy angle uh, as mm -hmm. well that are that are pushing where pharma is looking uh, and what the ROI is on some of these investments from either uh, 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 buying assets or developing them yourself in-house. So we're seeing uh, continued interest in the biologic space at a, at a macro level. We've seen the pipeline shift. Uh, from uh, from about forty from from about thirty percent to to close to forty percent forty five percent biologics uh, uh, over the last five years or so. We think that shift uh, is 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 likely to continue probably uh, uh, over the next five years. And in terms of that, what what uh, what segments of the space are, are are interesting? Well, we've certainly seen a resurgence in the idea and the the concept of conjugating an antibody to to another uh, drug moiety, whether that is a small molecule uh, cytotoxic, like an ADC antibody drug conjugate, or to a, uh, a, a radio ligand, uh, such as a radio pharmaceutical, which is uh, mm. targeted radio pharmaceutical therapy. So antibody plus uh, uh, radioisotope. So that that trend kind of fits for the uh, the de-risking. You've got two moieties that are kind of known quantities. The combination of them is what is novel and patentable. Uh, so that's that's a major area of interest. Uh, certainly, the the success mm -hmm. of the the uh, 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 obesity drug class uh, with the GLP ones has, has driven a resurgence in interest in in peptides, cyclic peptides as 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 a uh, as a macro class. Uh, and and while I would say the uh, the enthusiasm is not what it was a few years ago in what we'd call the advanced modality space, cell, gene, RNA, there's still pockets of that that are very very exciting. Uh, I think in in the cell therapy space, so uh, where either you take a patient cells. Uh, directly out of their body, engineer them, return them, or from uh, from a donor, uh, allogeneic donor. I think that that space is interesting in, in terms of advancements in solid tumor 
Uh, that space has historically been successful in, in hematologic oncology. So we're getting interested about solid tumor in that space, the autoimmune space of so getting out of cancer entirely. And then more broadly for stem cell derived cell therapies, regenerative medicine, uh, seeing some early data in Parkinson's in um, diabetes. That's quite exciting in that space. Uh, and then I would also keep your eyes on the mRNA space. Uh, I think what the uh, what Moderna, BioNTech are doing with uh, cancer vaccines in terms of uh, combinations with uh, uh, immuno-oncology drugs, pdl ones plus uh, RNA cancer vaccines, sometimes personalized uh, uh, cancer vaccines is, is, is quite interesting and uh, has potential to be a meaningful uh, market should that that materialize. So that's what I would say are the, the kind of big picture trends, mm -hmm. tools and modalities. Adam, anything to add there? Yeah, I think the the one elephant in the room that that maybe we haven't touched on is is the peptides. Um, obviously, the the GLP ones have have really taken to the forefront here, and and no matter where you go, you hear a lot about them. Um, I think that there's a lot of innovation that's happening outside of you know Lilly and and, and Novo Nordisk. Um, you know, in terms of thinking about other variations of the GLP ones moving into orals, et cetera. So. It, you know, the, the, the story there is not uh, stopping. It's continuing to evolve. And I think as that happens, novel technologies may be needed to be able to, to enhance the scalability of how these molecules are being made, whether that's through recombinant means and finding better, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, yeast or, or bacterial cells that can in increase titers. Or if they're doing it more from a synthetic purpose of, uh, you know, from uh, synthetic chemistry and and and, and solid phase synthesis to really drive uh, uh, scalability of these, because you know, as as all the reports okay. show, the utilization and, and and demand for these drugs is not waning uh, and is likely to increase over the over the coming you know decade plus. Um, so I do think that that's uh, certainly an area where there's a lot of interest in understanding how that may uh, unfold in which. Uh, methods may win out is is certainly something that's on the tips of a lot of people's tongues as well. Thank you. And and where does small molecules fit in? The remainder. It's it is and will continue to be a a major piece of the pipeline. It's been sixty percent historically, probably closer to fifty percent going forward. Uh, but I would say we we think that the, the death of small molecule that was predicted with some of the early uh, reaction to the Inflation Reduction Act is is, is quite overstated. It's a it's it's a foundational modality that's that's not going anywhere. Pharma is, is, is quite good and, and advanced at discovering them. We do think some of these advances in, in AI are going to help accelerate uh, uh, some of the discovery and development phases of particularly with small molecules and, and modeling some of those interactions with their biological targets. This is something that AI is quite good at uh, and, and it's an optimization problem effectively, which is, which is a very strong use case there. So we think that with anything will accelerate uh, the, the capability in, in the early value chain there. And from a market standpoint, uh, they're, we know how to make them. They're very scalable to produce. Uh, they have favorable margins when, when branded. Uh, they can penetrate cells and hit targets that antibodies and some other biologics can't. So they're, they're not going anywhere. They're going to continue to be a, a, a core piece of the pharma armamentarium going forward. I do think that we are seeing this complexity increase as we think about the drugs, right? I mean, the, the HPAPI, that is one piece of the ADC. Right, so it includes both a biologic as well as the small molecule, right? And these hybrid molecules, to, to Jeff's point earlier, whether that that is an antibody to a, a high potent API or an antibody conjugated to a radioisotope or an antibody conjugated to uh, an oligonucleotide, right? These are all things that are being developed, and it and it requires uh, uh, you know technologies and knowledge bases that span from the biologics and over into the small molecules. Right. So so some of the advanced modalities, inclusive of the oligonucleotides, synthetic peptides, et cetera, are while you know they, they can be produced in a recombinant or biologic manner, some of them, depending on their structures and sizes, may be produced synthetically as well. So there's a there's this overlap in the Venn diagram of certain molecules that again have a little bit more. Uh, 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 safety in terms of their, 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 what I would say is a more advanced traditional molecule um, that people can produce and produce in a scaled manner um, at a more approachable price point than what we're seeing, at least historically, with the cell therapies and gene therapies as well. Very interesting. You mentioned earlier there's this 300 billion revenue gap 
the GLP-1 market, I think, is is forecast to be about 100 billion of that. What about the rest? All these other modalities we've been discussing, are they enough to fill that gap? Uh, that's a $64,000 question, Luke. And I think that's that's why the industry is, is excited about uh, uh, taking multiple pronged approach here. It's, it's not piling all the eggs into one basket. There's not one modality that every company is is getting in on. You're seeing a kind of diversification across the industry. Some are getting into radio pharma. Some are heavily into ADC. Some are uh, focusing more on, on, on peptides or other small molecule variants. Some are still into cell, cell and gene therapy. Uh, others are looking at siRNA or, or oligonucleotide therapies. Uh, mo- most are picking some comp- linear combination of, of the modality space and, uh, and, and, and looking at multiple pronged approaches to, to fill that gap. And it will be a mix of, uh, business development, M&A of assets, as well as in, in, in-house discovery and development, uh, to try to fill that gap. But to your point, uh, the, the there has been a piling in, in, in the obesity space, uh, from a therapeutic area standpoint that continues to be quite hot, uh, neurology and neuroscience, I would say immunology more broadly and autoimmune also, uh, are, are what we see as, as spaces with a significant amount of interest in investment and development uh, as, as we have getting better tools to, to investigate those and prosecute those diseases. Clearly a lot going on and a lot of complexity. How do you do this when it comes to forecasting supply and demand and you're going from three out to 10 years out? It'd be great to understand some of those methodologies which you employ at LEK to try to to try to do some of this model. Sure, sure. So I, I would say let's let's focus on, say, a given pipeline or a given modality, pick, pick a modality of choice to just take ADCs or something like this, for example. So we, we want to look at the pipeline and then try to understand how that pipeline is going to evolve. So that involves using the length of phase and the probability of success for assets to, we, we would stock and flow assets through the pipeline uh, with, with, a, with a methodology to look at how things are going to evolve from year to year. Uh, so try to get a three to five year outlook. Uh, beyond that, it's quite quite high variance. Uh, so we, we we would stick at something like that, and then in terms of understanding the actual supply and demand, uh, this this can depend on the modality that you're looking at. What you want to understand is what's the fundamental unit of analysis that's that's going to drive demand. Uh, often this is this is phase trials or, or or trials by phase for things that bulk buy and that there's not a huge difference between a phase two trial in uh, indication X versus indication mm-hmm. Y. Then in that map that what matters there is is effectively trials by phase. And that's what we want to predict with that pipeline evolution. But sometimes patients becomes the fundamental unit of analysis. And that's what matters. Autologous cell therapy would be a great example of this. Uh, if your trial has 100 patients or 300 patients, that's a threefold uh, difference in batch demand because one batch, one patient, if you're making an autologous cell therapy. Uh, another example of that would be viral vector gene therapies. There were very, very large differences in the doses required to make those therapies. Uh, so take something like a Luxterna, which treats the eye uh, that had uh, a, an amount of virus required that was four to five orders of magnitude less than the amount needed for Zolgensma, which was an IV infusion for, for spinal muscular atrophy. So uh, with that huge of a delta in dose demand, then then patients uh, ultimately end up driving the, the batch demand because uh, you can, in, in some of those larger dose uh, archetypes, you can actually make so few doses from a given batch. So what you ultimately want to understand is what's the what's the driver fundamental mm-hmm. unit of analysis that you need to understand to drive demand. And then we typically look at the pipeline and pull back and say, can we archetype the pipeline? Are there different flavors of, uh, of, of programs in these pipelines? Sometimes it's by therapeutic area. Sometimes uh, it's by dose uh, archetype, which is what we just described with the viral gene therapies. So try to archetype and then think about stocking and flowing archetypes through a, through a pipeline and building up from that fundamental unit of analysis, whether it's trials by phase or patients, to get a, a, a view on demand. I think then within that, though, we also start thinking about where innovation is going to come, what can potentially be unlocked based on, you know, technical breakthroughs based on clinical breakthroughs, right? If we think about cell therapy, there's a there's still biological questions of can we really fully unlock solid tumors? Can we really unlock autoimmune diseases? And so you get into scenario planning as well of what you have to believe uh, in order for a market to be X big or Y big, right? And so you start playing those uh, different scenarios out to get to, be, to get to have some ranges. Um, because as 
many of us uh, in, in this field think, right? We we don't have that crystal ball, right, to say definitively that this is going to happen and or or that is going to happen. And so, you know, it's it's a lot of kind of again gaming out which types of scenarios are are likely or not likely. And one final question. What would you say the biggest mistake is that people make when they're trying to predict the success of new modalities or trying to predict capacity? And how could you avoid it? I think that there's often a level of trying to be overly precise on things and you get to a a point of false precision, um, right? Because there's so many of these modalities may be more emerging, right? If we think about the probabilities of success of cell and gene therapy versus others, or how we think about it in oncology versus autoimmune and, and really trying to zero in on what we think the, 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 the very specific and precise numbers are. I think that's where people tend to fall a, a little short. I think the other thing is um, as we think about um, uh, 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 maybe the, the long, long-term horizons, Right. These are things that need to be updated very frequently, semi-annually, annually, right? Because everything is so dynamic and, and not having an updated and, and evergreen view, I think is something where perhaps some companies may fall short as well. Gentlemen, fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, Luke. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity, Luke. Experience the future of contract manufacturing at CDMO Live 2025. Join us at the World Trade Center Rotterdam on May the 7th and 8th, 2025 for an exclusive event that brings together the sharpest minds in biopharma outsourcing. For two days filled with market insights, best practices and partnering. Early bird tickets are now available, so head to cdmolive.com to download the agenda and to book your ticket.